Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Bowling. Freedom of freaking fiends, ho. Freedom fiends, you're uh you're this is a live remote broadcast. Tell us where you are and what you're doing there, Nima Vidati. I'm in League City, Texas, just south of the H. Even dirtier south than Houston. We're by the coast. I was uh keeping it real, yeah. <laughs> Keep League City weird. <laughs> it's not weird in League City, it's just kinda boring. I know. That's where uh, DJ went to your your brother's high school. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Your wife went to the same high school as my little brother, Frank. Yep. yep. Is uh, Frank with us today? Yeah, Frank's with us. Hey, Frank, holla. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Cool. So we're going to have our uh, last 15 minutes are going to be with Frank telling us his tales of woe with the police of Texas. Yeah, in the last segment, uh, we'll do a little interview with Frank. He had a run-in with the law. Um, of course, he's adamantly f the police, um, but it looks like the police got the best of him and sort of f him in this situation. <laughs> the police are f the Frank. Yeah, police are f Frank. They've been harassing him lately. He just put a boom boom in his trunk. You know, he got yeah. that boom now, so the cops are going to keep an extra eye on him. It's something about young men, man. My my stepson gets hassled all the time too. Yeah, yeah. He's he's more like your age. How old's Frank? Frank's uh, twenty, I think. You twenty, Frank? He's twenty. Yeah. Cops don't mess with me. I'm 47. They're like, oh, he's square. He can't be any trouble. <laughs> Cops messed with me when I was Frank age. So, yeah, maybe it's a it's a young thing. Could also be a brown thing. And it's a music thing if you ride around town listening to boom, boom, boom. Yeah, because, you know, hip-hop is indicative of there goes the neighborhood. Yeah. Those, people, those brown people are taking over our neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, if they could do it, they'd ban hip-hop music in cars. So I am reading an awesome book. I'm going to review a book I've read one chapter of. It's called One Nation Under Sex by Larry Flint and David Eisenbach. Nice, nice. It's about the history of sex scandals in America and how they shaped politics. On the first page, it talks about how some uh, madam set up a brothel on the White House lawn during its construction. Really? Yep. Wow. And then, uh, then it leads on to Benjamin Franklin's libertine attitudes which is why they sent him to France. It was because, you know, the fact that he, he would screw anything that moves, and when he was 70, you know, the young ladies all still liked him, is part of what made him a good ambassador and got France to back us monetarily during the Revolutionary War. Because Ben Franklin was pimping. Yep. He knew how the game go. Yep, and he got a, uh, a disgraced French military man, von Steuben, who had been... He was too sexually libertine for the French army. He'd been uh, having sex with young boys, and he was kicked out of their army. And Franklin got Washington to hire him to train the American troops, who were a bunch of farmers. They didn't really know how to be soldiers. They could shoot, but they didn't know strategy. And uh, it didn't come up, and Franklin kind of like flubbed the guy's record and changed a few things, so it didn't come up. The book says... It didn't come up. The most likely scenario is that Franklin didn't asketh and von Steuben didn't tell it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I dig it. Well, I actually did get around to reading the first few chapters of Thaddeus Russell's book, A Renegade History of the United States. Oh, the one that we reviewed that we didn't read on our first cast? Yes, exactly. Uh, but I did get a chance to read the first few chapters. You know, it seems like in American history, there was always this interplay between, you know, sexual liberation and the puritanical aspects. You know, the Puritans were one of the first settlers of the United States. Well, I guess it wasn't the United States then, but back when it was the colonies. And, um, you know, at the same time, it was some of the freest times. You know, there was women who ran their own brothels. You know, there wasn't necessarily pimps because it wasn't pushed underground. And it was a free-for-all, and that's one of the reasons why um, America was really into freedom back in the day is, is people wanted to do what they wanted to do and they wanted to be left alone and that was that was a okay yeah worms 
<laughs> so, I've been working hard on updates on the film. I updated the... Uh, when we made the film, there was a part in it that said, under George Bush, medical marijuana places were raided by feds with guns drawn, mm -hmm. and it continued into Obama's first year, and then Obama stopped it. Obama stopped it for about a week. Yeah. It was like the week we made that line in the film, and he started back up again with reverence. So... We changed that part in the film. Did you see it? No, I didn't see the change, but uh, I, f <laughs> I figured that would have to be changed. I know that their Department of Justice recently did say, hey, you know, this is still illegal on the federal level. And then there was that decision recently saying there is no medical use for marijuana. So it's the same old, different face, same ruler. The movie's pretty much like where it needs to be now, and I like that you trust me to make updates on it. We said it took four months to make, but it's really taken a year to make because it's continued to evolve and we've continued to push it and tweak it and uh but it's it's version 3.3 which is director's cut 33 which is where i i'm really liking it we'll probably have to update a few law things next year before it comes out for real but yeah i guess that's the thing and it'll never be perfect i mean these laws in the legal field is always going to be changing uh i've got a cousin right now who's uh just started a dispensary in colorado and he he says the, the stuff changes on an almost daily basis they've always got to be abreast of what new regulations and what what city councils are, are looking at to do and who's who's after them this day and it's confusing and conflicting too for instance the fda last month said that medical marijuana has no med marijuana has no medical use and then this week the department of veterans affairs okayed medical marijuana oh good that's a good that's a good step for which them. is interesting because we have the guy the va patient who's blurred out in the movie because he he was afraid for you know losing his benefits but i guess we could blur him out unblur him now but i'm not gonna it's that's you know <laughs> He's blurred. It's good. You could ask him, but that'd be a lot, a lot it of backwards is, editing it, to do. It adds to the movie too. You know. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that he's blurred and that for that moment in time. I also, you know, don't trust that the laws won't change again. So I'm going to just leave it how it is. And there's also, if you want to get the movie, if you go to gunsandweed.com and click on the link that says "Get Movie" over on the left. You can go to a page that has two different BitTorrent links, the little green icons. One is for the torrent for. The DVD ISO and one is for a really good looking 800 meg DVD rip of just the movie. Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> we want we want you to see it. Go see it. This DVD does not have the uh, you know all the menu. It just has one menu and a play movie button. It doesn't have the uh, does not have the DVD extras and stuff. I was like, we'll just save that for when it comes out, you know. But if someone wants to look at the movie and wants it to look good, and be sure to seed if you do BitTorrent. Definitely, definitely. Seeding is is good. Dope, dope. So, we had our first downloader from Iran, in Tehran. Tehran. Oh, really? Well, I was just with a lot of my Iranian family staying at uh, this palatial beach house that my rich second cousin has. And uh, I was telling them a little bit about the movie and what I've been doing maybe, lately. So maybe, maybe they emailed someone back home. Maybe they did. That's possible. Because I've, I've never... You know, I keep track of like where the torrenters are and stuff. I look at the little map that comes up and... I've never seen one from Iran. Yeah, yeah. Iran. Uh, same with my I Own Me video. I, I was always crossing my fingers, hoping, oh, I'll get somebody from Iran who Googles Nima or, or looks for my name or something, and somebody will get to pick it up. And then I was like, oh, well, maybe, you know, it's hard to, to get complete internet freedom in a country like Iran right now. But uh, that's yeah. amazing. If, if somebody's bit torrenting our movie in Tehran, I love it. It's probably Akhamenejian Minimajad's son. <laughs> yeah, he's chilling. He you know, you don't look. You Dojo. don't look like Bin Laden. Someone said you did. You look more like Akhamenejian. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Dina Jad. Could be, could be my third cousin or something. <laughs> he wears a suit jacket too. He wears a suit jacket, but no tie. So we had an interesting comment. Did you read this comment of the fan we had on the podcast? who's from Wyoming, who says, my only beef with you guys is how you continue to talk about Wyoming. You're going to get people to move here, and we don't want more people to move here. I did, and I, you addressed it really well. And to me, the first thing I'm thinking is anybody listening to our podcast that would actually move to Wyoming because of it is going to be the kind of people we want moving to Wyoming. Well, the people we want. But this it's the kind of people this guy would want, too. I mean, yeah. he's a he's a third-generation Wyomingite. He's a coal miner. But he's a gun guy, and he's a freedom guy, and he's worried that our podcast is going to turn 
the rest of Wyoming into Jackson, you know, the playground for the rich liberals. Yeah, right. It would be the opposite, I think. I mean, I understand where he's coming from. One of the most amazing things about Wyoming is that it's so sparsely populated and that you can just drive for a little bit and be out in the middle of nowhere where there's no people, nobody's going to bug you. I know that that's one way of, of being truly free is just being away from anybody who could bug you. Yeah. So that makes sense. I get where he's coming from. But I'm not really worried about it. Of course, I don't live in Wyoming anymore. You do. So are you worried about their going no. to the neighborhood or what? I mean, first of all, I've been ranting about how great Wyoming is for two years. Actually, longer, since before I moved here, on the web at every chance I get. And no one I know has moved here. And they would let me know. They'd be like, yeah, hey, yeah. I'm moving there. Talk, you know. And it's actually driven off a lot of my lefty friends that this guy would hate if they moved here. You know, me saying, hey, this place is great. You can open carry a rifle and you can conceal carry a pistol without a permit. That's going to make them never want to even visit here. Yeah, yeah. Has there, um, speaking of constitutional carry, which you guys have had in effect for a little bit more than a month now, right? I was wondering, once that happens, okay, so if there's ever any violent crime, does that mean the papers are going to blame it on this? If there's any gun crime? Not the papers, but the commenters on the papers. I mean, uh, like four days after that happened, that guy killed his family in some trailer park. Oh, right, and, right. You know, a few people commented on the Casper Red Star Tribune, like, oh, see what happens with our gun laws? And it's like... That doesn't have anything to do with it. No. That guy was in his home where you can have a gun regardless, and it had nothing to do with that law. Yeah, yeah. People have a really silly sense of causality sometimes. I mean, saying something like that is like saying wet sidewalks cause rain. It's not as backwards, but it, <laughs> it, there's no relationship. I liked your comment before of crazy people shooting people wouldn't stop or start or change in a libertarian paradise. It's like lightning strikes wouldn't stop whether there's a government or not. Right. I tell people that a lot, especially other journalists when I'm explaining my positions. They're like, so, so, I mean, what, you think that, that crime would just go away? That people would just stop hurting each other and stealing from each other? And one of the people in Ghana, Africa, who was presenting to brought up a similar argument. Well, you know, a lot of times when people are arguing against libertarianism, there's a few rote arguments that come up and they're so predictable like i almost think that these things are taught in school now or something because i just hear them every time like well if you're a libertarian you shouldn't drive on the road and my answer is there's a monopoly i don't have a choice if i want to go anywhere so basically when somebody says something like oh well would there be less crime i don't think there would you know my my argument is not necessarily i don't think there'd be less people going and murdering people or, or less theft necessarily there could be but my main argument is there'd be no government theft there'd be no taxes well governments cause more problems i mean i think if the government could control lightning strikes they'd probably use them for evil i mean there's some conspiracy theorists who think that there's a big array of uh, electromagnetic pulse generators up in Alaska, the HARP array, that are made to, you know, they're saying that, like, all these hurricanes are because of our government. But I don't know about that. <laughs> but if they could, they would. They'd use them for warfare. If they could, they would. Exactly. The other thing is, I mean, if you really think about statistic, who's killed more people than anybody else in the 20th century? It wasn't Joe Blow. It wasn't serial killers. It wasn't even people like Charlie Manson. It was governments. Over 200 million people died in, in the 20th century. Okay, in order of worst, it's probably Stalin, Mao, Hitler, America. There is new scholarship on Mao that says he might have killed upwards of, you know, 50 million. So, so Mao and Stalin are fighting for top two. But yeah, governments massacre their people. They do experiments, as we did in the earlier cast. They experiment on people. And not only that, but if you looked at theft numbers, everybody pays taxes. So in essence, just about everybody in the world is being stolen from on a continual basis. And, you know, another, like, rote argument I hear against libertarianism is, if you want a libertarian paradise, go to Somalia or go to Darfur. And I'm like, those aren't libertarian paradise. You know, it's like guns are legal. You can do whatever you want there and people get killed all the time. But the thing is, the citizens don't have the guns to protect themselves against it because the UN has come in and benevolently taken the guns away from everybody in those places. Right, right. And that's a failure of history. There is, you know, some autonomous zones and, and things where, where the economy has kept going and it's it's growing fast. Of course, they're starting from very low. But look at the history. You know, Somalia has not been free for much time at all. You know, they've had government intervention, not only from their own, but from the UN, from the United States, wars. There's no way you can look at Somalia and say, 
that they're what a libertarian paradise would be yeah. because they've been getting screwed over and continue to have designs on their society from outside Western forces like the United States government and the UN. Those arguments are inherently bunk because they fail to look at any history. Bringing it back to this guy's letter of saying, you know, I love your podcast, but quit trying to get people to move here. First of all, I think that we're keeping liberals out. If any of them pay attention to my media and you're in my media, it's like, yeah, I don't want to go yeah, there. Yeah, they crap their pants when they see this kind of stuff. And, you know, secondly, I mean, let's talk a little bit about freedom of travel and the freedom to live anywhere, which America has more than most places. And I'm not just talking about, like, you know, freedom of travel is a term for people who you drive without a license plate. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about... Like, everywhere I've ever lived, you know, I've lived a bunch of places in my life, usually for years at a time, but everywhere I've been, people have been like, oh, you're not from around here. You know, I'm from upstate New York, then I lived in Washington, D.C., and I was in the punk rock. On the periphery of the punk rock scene, you know, the hardcore punk rock scene in the early 80s there when I was like 18, 19, and they were outsiders and outcasts, but I was an outcast among the outsiders. And then I moved to San Francisco, and I worked as a bike messenger, but it's like, I wasn't really in with them. Yeah. You know, I've never, even if I've tried to get into the outcast groups or the mainstream groups or whatever, people have always looked at me of, oh, you're from somewhere else. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you're not of our tribe. And in California, I lived there 26 years. And finally, after 26 years, people were like, okay, you're a Californian. But everyone in LA and New York is from somewhere else anyway. So that's a place you can do that. And then I moved to Wyoming, and it's like, I've been here two years. I'm paying a mortgage. I'm paying taxes. I'm I'm doing the things that people do that establish residency legally. Right. And it's like, people that have grown up here are never going to accept me as one of them. You know, so I could, I could not, I really don't believe that an outsider could run for political office here and win. Not that I plan on it, but if you look at like, the state legislators here, they all grew up here or at least have been here for 30 or 40 years. Right, you know? and you look at their last names and the, they're the same last names on as the names of counties or as the names of big roads and towns. They're families that have been there since, you know, yeah. their grandpa's grandpa homesteaded and sheared sheep. And it's really like what I would say is I'm no threat to anybody here and I don't do anything to diminish any aspect of Wyoming and I only make it better because I don't initiate any aggression on anyone. I'm not forcing anyone to do anything. I have like written letters to politicians saying you should not outlaw spice. And maybe someone who thinks spice should be outlawed thinks that I'm a bad contribution to Wyoming by doing that. But those guys don't listen to me anyway, and they're not going to change the law because of my letter. So, you know, they just write me back and say, we know best. Yeah, <laughs> we know better than you. Yeah, that, that we know better than you attitude uh it's it's getting scarier and scarier. I mean, you have this super Congress they're talking about, where they're going to have twelve people not accountable to the general public. What for is their that? Decision. I've heard that term, but what is that? From what I understand, as part of this new debt deal, the Congress is like, "Well, we got to get it done and start wiffle waffling." The public wants us to actually take care of our business, yada yada. You know, get things done. That kind of attitude. Let's do something. So the thought is, you'd have a twelve-member quote unquote super Congress which sounds scary in itself, and they would be able to make decisions, make amendments to bills that nobody in the other parts of Congress would be able to to refute. So normally, you know, anybody in Congress can add an amendment or vote against it, and the super Congress would sort of have the final say on some aspects of bills. And so they would be able to vote on that, and basically you'd be taking this body that is supposed to be representative of the whole country, even though you know there's really not enough people in it now to do that, and you'd be making it even smaller. The, the real decision-making body would be a group of 12 elite members of Congress. So you'd get rid of, I doubt they'd let any Tea Party member in it. That's horrifying, it, Completely man. horrifying. It's, it's unconstitutional, too, because the Article 1 of the Constitution says representatives shall be appointed among the several states, which means from every state. And there's way more than 12 states, as we all know. Yeah. It would probably be equally Democrat and Republican, but it would probably be equally statist, too. It would be completely statist. It would would only be establishment people in it. It's not going to happen. I hope not. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, they just don't care anymore. They haven't cared for a while. I mean... One of the biggest examples in my mind was when they were going through the whole bailout process and 99% of people, you know, thousands of calls congressmen were getting saying, we don't want this. You know, it was very clear that the American public had a consensus against bailing out Wall Street and they did it anyway. It looks like Obama has signed legislation for this. For the super Congress? 
Yeah. Well, as far as I know, it was part of the debt deal. So I don't know what other steps need to be taken for it to actually be created. Yeah. As far as I know, it was in some form approved or the thought of it was approved. And now, the NEMA News with NEMA Vidati. And now, for your daily dose of nanny statism in our daily segment, Tyranny Today. Tyranny Today. And as far as them not caring, it's, it's happening on local levels in places, too. In one place in Washington State and here in Houston, from what my mom is telling me, there's a battle over, you know, red light cameras. You know, the cameras they put, they take a picture of your license plate and write you a ticket if you run the red light. People hate those things. Across the board, in general, most people who drive think it's just ridiculous that I can get mailed a ticket. Maybe even it gets lost in the mail and then I get a failure to appear. It ends up being thousands of dollars by the time it's all said and done. People hate it. Yeah, and it's like, like you said, there are times when you need to speed up over the limit for safety. You know? Exactly, and, and the same is true, Just true of red minute. lights. Legislating what people should do on, on a minute or a second-to-second -second basis in front of the steering wheel is completely ridiculous. But people voted against it. You know, there was a referendum. Uh, there was a city council vote in Washington, and then the same thing here. And the city councils, even though the people said, we don't want these red light cameras, get away from it. There's a city council in Washington state that's suing or going to a judge to say that they can still do this. The city council here in Houston has said, well, we still want to do it anyway. So even when you have a majority of people voting in the approved democratic process against something, the higher-ups, the elites that say, we know better than you, they don't even care anymore. They're going to do it anyway. They're going to go get their cash cow. They're going to loot the public. It's getting to a point where I hope that people see this and realize, wait a minute, I think I know who the bad guy is. There's a new law in Missouri that bans teachers from friending students on Facebook. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking about that, and it's like, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be to protect the kids or protect favoritism or something, but, like, in a real egalitarian, libertarian world where education is private and good, of course you'd be able to communicate with your teacher online. That's how you do a lot of it, you know? Right, and you'd want to have a friendly relationship with them. Yeah. College, I mean, college students do that. College students email back and forth with their professors. Yeah, they do. Of course, that would be uh, you know, a lib pair situation. And I think if you had a, a private school or something like that, there would be cases where maybe the school would have a policy against fraternizing with the students on Facebook. And we'd be fine with that if you want to ban it on a private school level. Tyranny today. Here's more tyranny. Bill O'Reilly, Mr. The Government Should Be Limited and Small, wants a national sales tax because uh, he says that people who operate in the black market like drug dealers are getting away with not paying any taxes. Ugh. See, and that just goes back to the point of what the drug war does as far as getting people who might be or say they are limited government asking for more government power, just like the Cold War did. Well, we need big government for just this one thing. But it's the camel's nose under the tent. Once you have big government, you have big government. Doesn't matter what it's for. Yep. It's there. Also, speaking of flip-flopping and, and small government people going back on their word, Rick Perry, you know, he's... He's, he thinks he's been called, Texas governor who thinks he might have been called to run for president, hasn't announced yet. He took a very Ron Paul position on states' rights when it came to gay marriage at one point. He said, you know, if folks in, in New York want to make a law, that doesn't bug us here in Texas. You know, he's, he's always been sort of a big states' rights guy, at least when it was politically popular for him. I don't really think he feels that way. But he's been using it as a political gravy train. Well, recently he went back on that and flip-flop, and now he's supporting... Uh, nationwide constitutional amendment that would ban gay marriage. Yeah, Michelle Bachman is in favor of banning gay marriage, but she recently said in an interview, yeah, when I go to the beach, I like to bring Von Mises and read him. Yeah, yeah. These are just people throwing out buzzwords to try to catch a few people who may be uh, leaning libertarian or who may have read about Lauren Paul. I, I'm free market, but not with who you marry. Yeah, exactly. It's just playing politics. I mean, those kind of ideas are are starting to come up. So they're trying to, to cast that wide net and say they hate gay people, and yet they love Von Mises. I've been watching Bo Mob Week, Movie Week, uh, hosted by Rudy Giuliani. That seems appropriate. <laughs> That's and totally you know, appropriate. He's, he's on there because he's Italian-American and because he... Uh, Supposedly took down the mob in New York, but really, I think he's a mobster in New York. Yeah, he, he didn't take down the mob. He just let the government mob win or, or led the government mob yeah. to victory. I think about that all the time, especially when, when we talk about anti-gang stuff or, or I have to do some anti-gang stories. A gang is, is just a smaller form of, of the government. I mean, they're, they're a collectivist group that uses violence to achieve their means. 
they have their own flags and their own colors and yeah. uniforms. It's the same shit. Something I've been thinking about recently is the fact that the places that the mob has thrived the most, New York, New Jersey, and Chicago, are the places where it's impossible for a citizen to legally carry a gun. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder, with all the political connections that the mob had, if they were actually behind some of the anti-gun laws to give them a monopoly. I'd be willing to conjecture that some of the mob members back in the day even had carry permits where no citizen could get them. It's possible. Not that they'd, not that they'd care about permits, but, you know, they might, or their bodyguards might have or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know that there were certain members of the mob who uh, were fans of Prohibition, obviously, and supported it in, in their public lives. Supported the Prohibition of alcohol because that was, again, part of their gravy train. That gives them, not a monopoly, but that gives them the market share of trafficking alcohol because the legitimate businessmen wouldn't get into it. And obviously, people in the mafia are not legitimate businessmen. So you were just you just turned around and said hello to your little little brother. How old is he? My little how old are you, Knight? Ten. He's ten. He's watching you talk to a computer. <laughs> yeah, he's watching me talk to a computer. Of course the, anybody in the room with me now only hears my voice, they don't hear you, so I sound like a crazy person spouting off invective at nothing. I remember the first time I ever saw someone with one of those Bluetooth ear phones yeah yeah and it was it was in san francisco i thought it was a crazy person it was a businessman and it's being a guy in a business suit in the financial district in san francisco in it might not have even been it might have been pre-bluetooth it was like 1988 or something i think he probably had a thin wire going into his coat okay okay you know i just i was riding my bike i was bike messenger and i saw this i stopped at a red light and i saw this (laughs) this businessman just talking to himself yeah. agitatedly on the street corner and i'm like wow <laughs> you're like wow that bum dress is nice i know <laughs> speaking of talking to computers talk about your talk to uh ghana to ghana yeah that was an amazing experience uh for those who don't know um me and Michael have been working with this group called Africa Youth Peace Call run by a guy called Africanus Kofi don't really remember what the last name is. He's got is. about four names. I call him Kofi. I, you know, Africa, people have four or five yeah, names a lot. I call him Kofi, too. But uh, he's this guy in Ghana. He's getting this group together to promote liberty and freedom in Africa. He's got it together. It's been together for he's years. He's got the group together, but he's trying to expand it. Uh, they were doing yeah. a, a freedom camp, basically, where they were you know helping teach people about the ideas of freedom. Me and Michael both did Skype talks, and that's an amazing thing. I had to get up, obviously, really early in the morning so that I could meet their yeah. deadline. So I'm up at four in the morning. I just click on my Skype and I'm giving a lecture on the basics of Austrian economics to people in Africa. It was an amazing thing. You know, I, I, I was going a little fast. You know, they had to stop me about five minutes into it. They're like, um, your American accent is really thick. So can you please slow down? And I'm like, OK, I'll slow down. Yeah. When I traveled Europe lecturing, I used to write on my hand. Talk slow. Talk slow. Right, right. And I'd like I'd be holding the microphone and I'd look down and see it and it would remind me. And that was countries where English was people's second language. In Ghana, English is the first language, but they have this really thick accent and they think our accent is hard to understand yeah well it is i mean to them it it's an accent that we have yeah just like when i i yep. can't watch the british version of the office because i don't get the jokes because I, I i can barely <laughs> understand what they're saying and i don't get the cultural references no it's because it's not funny or that but i really love the american office well anyway yeah i'm talking to these guys i had to slow down the other thing is um you know i've done a lot of public speaking but never to where i couldn't see the audience you know usually yeah. when you speak they to could public, see you but you could you did you do video Skype? Um, because of their connection, they decided it'd be best to not have their video because it slowed things down. So, right. So they could. That's what I did. They they could see me, but I couldn't see right, them. Right. But Kofi sent me a picture of them too. Of you know, it was a room like a lecture hall. Yeah. Kind of looked like church. It was pretty cool. And Pete Voluntarist Air is going to be doing one. We set him up with it oh, too. Cool. Cool. He's going to record his. And I'm doing another one tomorrow too. After our movie shows, they're showing our movie. They're still downloading it. But uh, <laughs> they're going to show it, and then I'm going to do a Q and A afterwards, and I'm going to record both of the mine and Pete's. Right, right. It was a very awesome experience. They had great questions. You know, I, I think I was scheduled for an hour. My talk lasted about half an hour, and they asked questions for forty or fifty minutes. We went over time. A lot of them were very smart about what was going on. They understood that governments are violence. A lot of them did, because you know, you live in Africa. It's a lot. It's a lot more thinly veiled than it is here in the states. Plus, they had a revolution there in the fifties. They were a British colony until the fifties. Right, 50s. right. And they were very. They obviously knew about the dangers of imperialism and 
war because of that. You know, they were a British colony. So very great questions and very inspiring to see people in Africa identifying themselves as libertarian and realizing how silly restrictions are. And, you know, they were telling me stories. One guy was saying, you know, sometimes I, I need to, to take a taxi, take a car. You know, it's hard to do. Prices go up. And it's illegal for, you know, certain people to, to ride motorbikes into town in certain places, to ride rickshaws. And, you know, I was telling him, you know, you got to go look back at who's causing that. That's the government planners deciding what gets to go where. And that's why your prices are high in those situations. And look at why there's congestions. You know, everybody's like, the roads, the roads, the roads. Well, the government roads cause traffic. You know, why is a government road system the best way to travel? We don't know that. We don't know what the market is. And it's amazing how tyrannical their government has gotten in 50 years of, of independence from Britain, whereas, you know, it took us nearly 200 years to get nearly that tyrannical. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I can't really speak to why that is. I'm not. An They're more I'm tyrannical gone. there than here. You know, America's a, be a better, freer place to live than Ghana. Yeah. I guess one of the things, though, is it seems like um, here in America, at least, it's the mainstream for people to love the government in some way. And, and, I, and we have this split where it's red team and blue team. So you can hate the Democrats in government and you can hate the Republicans in government. You know, I hope at least in Ghana that there's less of that. I hope they have less of this warship of their government, uh, less of uh, kids getting brainwashed in history books because they do have a shorter history of their government. They can't say our government's been protecting people and keeping babies out of the coal mines for 250 years. Their history books can't say that. So I'm hoping that, you know, their people aren't as brainwashed as the American people usually are. Well, I think that also governments there, governments in Africa, they haven't figured out what Western governments have figured out, which is that if you give the cattle on the farm a little more freedom, they can produce more money for you to steal. Right, right, right. You know, they try to control every aspect of it there to the point where people can't even make a living to be taxed. Much. I think that's an effect of what I was just saying. I mean, I think the American yeah. cattle are a lot more docile. You can give them a little more free range because they're less likely to run away and, and be difficult for the cattle handlers. Yeah. Ghana, I've been studying Ghana, man. It looks like a really vibrant country, interesting culture, interesting music scene, very colorful music scene. It's got a good hip-hop scene. Yeah. They've also got a lot of natural resources. Uh, they're a big exporter of gold. Uh, they've got diamonds. They've discovered oil. So a lot of potential there for freedom and for prosperity. and Or for America to come in and colonize them like they've done in the Middle East. Yeah, unfortunately, there's potential for that too. But a lot of the questions were geared to that. What do we do? What happens? One question was, you know, everything is government and all the government's corrupt. So how do we as libertarians get to the top so we can fix it? And, you know, my answer is you don't try to get to the top. You start from the bottom. You get everybody on board. You get everybody to feel the way I do and, and to withdraw their consent through education. There was a quote I read recently. I'll paraphrase it. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was basically... You don't have to topple a dictator. You don't have to push him or knock him over. All you have to do is stop supporting him. He's standing on top of your hands. All you have to do is move him. You step out of the way. I had an experience recently that was a good analogy for um, picking and choosing your battles. Mm -hmm. One of our cell phones has a number that used to belong to someone else or someone was doing some kind of like cloning numbers or something. I think I mentioned this before. This crazy lady was calling us up yeah, yeah. like at all hours and saying like, you stay away from my husband. And we don't even know who she was. And finally, we paid to block her, but she kept calling from other numbers. What we ended up doing was paying 37 bucks and changing our phone number. I think 10 years ago, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been like, no, this is my number. And I would have like threatened her or yelled at her on the phone or whatever. And sometimes it's easier to just step out of the way. You know, I learned that when I lived with the wife beater living above me in San Francisco. You right. know, I made the mistake of, well, I lived here before him and I've lived here a long time and I'm rent controlled and I can't move out and it's my house. So I stayed there and lived in this hellish situation where I finally ended up, I went to court and then moved out of town. And it's like, I should have just moved out of town years ago. Moving out of San Francisco was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you just got to let things slide you know some some aggressions are small enough to where if you just ignore them they just roll off your shoulder i mean obviously i'm not a pacifist by any means but uh sometimes the best defense is not ignoring the problem but ignoring the the person who's perpetrating i mean and, and in, in essence that's what i'm suggesting we do with government just stop paying attention. Stop. They're like a baby. They're crying. They're a little bratty kid or a bully. And all you got to do is not let them get to you. 
Yeah. You know, another another analogy for that is the punk rock scene that I was in and around in Washington, D.C. in the early 80s, like Discord Records and stuff. Those bands started their own label, you know, basically because no label in the world would sign them. But then once they started their own labels, they realized they had a lot more freedom. And one of the labels and some of the bands even ended up making a lot of money and running a really... I mean, they're probably socialist people at their heart, but running a really libertarian free market business where, like, you know, they had five employees, they voluntarily paid for their health care, they ran a good business, people could leave for four months to go on tour if they wanted, and someone else would take up the slack. I've done interviews with Ian Mackay, the, the guy who runs that label, and consider him kind of a friend. We know each other from back in the day. And his take on it, wasn't that they were anti-major label it was that they were like extra major label you know it's it's not we don't exist to destroy that system we exist to live outside that system yeah yeah alternatives i mean that's what people are doing now in the food freedom movement a lot of times you know people are getting their co-ops together to to trade in raw milk and uh i've even read about food raves where people you know get together in <laughs> warehouses and have chefs food cook raves. them you know and this is mostly in california but they have the chefs cook them food that's not approved by the system or hasn't gone through you know the fda inspection process and they'll try to shut that down but it'll always find a way to work people always find a way to circumvent stupid laws right right i think that just proves the power of the market the market is a natural force and it will always get around whatever damn you place in its way always i was tacitly involved in the 80s with food not bombs do you know about them no no i'd love to hear it though yeah, i don't really like their politics they're pretty commie socialist but I do like what they do, which is they get donated food and leftover food and food that stores won't sell because it doesn't look good anymore, but it's still viable. And right. they'll cook with it and they'll cook meals and they'll go out on street corners and feed homeless people or poor people. And when I was a poor, starving musician in San Francisco, I used to eat at Food Not Bombs once or twice a month. And I also used to take part in protests and events that they had, not on a regular continuing basis, but once or twice. Yeah. And they're still around. I forgot about them completely, but I saw recently uh, Russia Today, Adam versus the man thing about them in some city back east in Ohio or somewhere. You know, the police closed them down for like food without a permit. Basically, like, we don't want you to help homeless people because you're encouraging the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've definitely heard of stories like that. It shows their face, and that's why I think stories like that should get out there more. The same thing with, you know, the cops busting the little girls running the lemonade stand. It just shows what they are. I mean, that's something anybody can look at, and they see who the villain is. And the villain in those situations is the government. The villain's not going to be the homeless people, and the villain's not going to be the people feeding the homeless people, and the villain's not going to be the little girl making lemonade. The villain in those stories is always the government and that's why i love stories like that and i think that those should be more prominent when we're talking about media i have two more of those one is a guy in casper was arrested last week for growing weed and for supposedly having explosive devices and basically he was a guy who liked weed and he liked model rockets and he had model rockets and engines <laughs> and the casper police wanted to make a federal case and they did and they called in dhs uh, and were like oh this guy may have bomb making supplies wow because you know, he was used, a model rocket hobbyist yeah you know i used to do model rockets when i was a kid and then stopped because i lived places that were so urban that you couldn't do model rockets and about six months ago i was thinking you know i could do that again in wyoming and it was kind of fun and you can also like get, now you can get like little cameras movie cameras you can put in the rocket and film like it going up and coming down with a parachute oh, yeah. which would be pretty cool yeah, that's awesome but i actually decided not to do it because i was thinking about that before this happened even like you know it's kind of a chilling effect on me like you know I'll bet that someone could consider that bomb-making material, yeah. so I'm not going to yeah, do it. Yeah, and they'd come in and steal your hard drive and steal all your guns, and you'd be in jail for a year while you got it figured out. And even if you did win, the cops may have already sold your guns. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm doing a grand experiment with my life. It's basically obeying all the laws and paying my taxes and then just ranting against the violence of the government and seeing what happens. <laughs> I'm interested to see how that plays out. And some people that I know that, and like do it a different way. Like Pete Ayer was arrested recently for smoking a joint at a marijuana rally in New Hampshire while carrying a gun. I'm wondering, I have to ask him if our movie inspired him to do that at all. Guns and weed. Oh, hopefully. But, <laughs> but, you know, I respect that, but it's not something I want to do. Because sooner or later, if you just keep getting arrested intentionally, it's not going to play out well. 
uh, you know, and I was telling the, the African people in Ghana this, when it comes to civil disobedience, it really only works if you've got a lot of people on board. And in a place yeah. like New Hampshire, you know, they don't have a ton of people on board. Or a lot of money for lawyers. Yeah, New Hampshire could which, use a lot more people before I think their civil disobedience is really going to start gaining traction. I respect what they do. I completely do. And they're way ahead of a place like Wyoming in civil disobedience. I mean, yeah, I think you're, pl- you're playing the right cards right now being in Wyoming. There's no way in Wyoming you get away yeah. with civil disobedience at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, even when you do have a lot of people on board, I mean, we're seeing this with the battle with, uh, you know, the car collectors out in the county. You know, they've been fighting this for, for forever. You know, I don't even know if they could win that battle if they all just decided to not pay their tickets. First of all, I don't think they'd decide that. The county would take their land. They already did that with that one sovereign citizen yeah. guy who had a lot of, he had cars and a big pile of trash, like rotting garbage and stuff that his neighbors could probably smell. You know, he was a little, they should not have taken his land. And I'm not even saying there should be a ticketable offense for that, but he was more visible than the people that just have a few classic cars. Yeah, yeah, he was. And he had people on his side. He tried to, he, he got together enough people for what he called his grand jury, and he tried to indict the government. <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> but he wasn't alone. So for the last part here, we got Frank on, and maybe your little, little brother? Maybe my little, little brother, mm-hmm. Knight, yeah, in a little bit. We'll, cool. let, we'll let Frank on first. Frank, go ahead and tell him who you are. What's up, Freedom Fiends? It's uh, Frank Vidotti. I'm Nima's brother. Frank's my little brother. He was also uh, made a cameo in the Guns and Weed movie. He was holding the the Mosin in a rifleman pose uh, during one of the scenes. Yeah, my five seconds of fame. <laughs> yep. Has, it, has that gotten you laid yet? Uh, I don't know if that's gotten me laid. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know if it's because of that. Uh, he's actually dating a Russian right now, and he showed oh, yeah. her his Russian rifle. <laughs> showed her my Nagant. I should, that just sounds wrong. I'm dating a Russian, and I showed her my Russian rifle. <laughs> it sounds so right. Was that your first line to her? Hey, baby, you want to come back to my place and see my Russian rifle? <laughs> want to come back and see my Mosin? So um, Frank recently had uh, a little run-in with the law. In fact, he's had a few run-ins with the law right now. Yeah. The police down here in coastal Texas apparently have a thing out for Frank right now. Um, driving while brown. Driving while brown. Driving while brown. With a Persian tattoo. Oh, you know, he's got his... He's got his name tattooed in Persian letters on his arm, just like I do. So maybe that's part of the reason. <laughs> maybe. But Frank, uh, he was actually uh, near a friend's house. Go ahead. I'll let you tell us what happened, Frank, you know, when you got the, the, the MIC. The MIC, minor in consumption. Well, basically, we were driving to uh, to my friend's apartments, and it's kind of in a not-so-nice area, so there's a lot of cops around. And uh, we stopped at the fire lane to drop them off, and then we went and parked. We went inside the house for an hour or so, and uh, we come back, we get in the car, and as we were backing up, cop pulls up behind us and, you know, flashes his lights and uh, stops us. He told us that we were in a parking violation because we stopped by the fire lane. He started flashing the flashlight in all of our eyes and asked us if we'd been drinking. Of course, we all lied and said no. After that, he got us all out the car one by one. He searched me, and he searched my three other friends that were in the car. Now, did he ask to search you, or did he just start searching you? Uh, no, he didn't ask. He, uh, he told me to get out the car, put my hands on the trunk. He asked if I had anything in my pockets that he should know about, and I said no, and he started to pat me down. Now, after that, I just stood by the cop car. He said he had been scoping out, the cops had been scoping out that apartment, because they're suspicious of the people that live there. I guess that was... Because they're brown and poor? Probably. (laughs) Might it have been a drug war thing where they... Yeah. Hoping to catch somebody with a plant that the government doesn't approve? The dude's house. We'll just call the dude... You just call him the dude. You don't even have to give him a fake name. We'll call him the dude. (laughs) He's the dude. And uh, they've caught him with green before, so they're always scoping out his place to see... Now, you did make up from when you were telling me right after it happened on the phone, because he called me, of course, you know, late at night. Oh, I yeah. just scooped stupid cops. <laughs> um, Had a rant. They asked you, you. You made a little fatal mistake, and Frank usually knows a lot of his stuff. You know, he won't let cops search, and he knows that they need probable cause. If they ask to yeah. search his car, he'll tell them no. He's sort of learned a little bit from his big brother, which is very good, and hopefully from his friends. But he asked you if you'd had anything to drink again when you were outside of the car. What happened Yeah, he asked me a second time. I said, yes, I had a few beers. Yes, I had a few beers. Now, why would you do that, Okay, that's also a problem because you should have said nothing to begin with and nothing there because lying to a cop 
is a crime in itself. Right. And Frank asked me that. He's like, well, I didn't want to lie. You know, uh, that was probably right after the Casey Anthony thing where the only thing that stuck was that she was perjury, lying mm. to the government. Which You cannot be arrested for silence. Exactly. and that's Although cop, cops don't take it well. They're like, ah, oh, troublemaker, eh? Right, right. It could go either way. It, but If it's a law to lie to a cop, wouldn't that be against the First Amendment? Because any speech... No, you're thinking Fifth Amendment, self-incrimination. Well, um, I think you're saying it could be a First Amendment thing, too. I it, mean, why don't I you have the right to... it could be a First Amendment, right? You to say a should have the a right cop. to lie or <laughs> tell the truth, you know? Well, yeah, should, if shoulds and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all be... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But you know, in that situation, I mean, what you should have done is just said, um, you know, I don't have to answer that. I don't know if that's the right wording, but ba- well, also the the thing is, were you about to drive the car or not? Uh, no, it's my friend's car. He wasn't okay, driving. Well, he wasn't in I the was driver's a passenger. seat. Well, then, what I would say, if you weren't in Texas, is it's not illegal to be mildly intoxicated, not it, driving. It is but it, if you're a it, minor. It is in Texas. It is if, oh, if, you're, if, if you're a minor. How old? Are you, how old is Frank? I'm twenty. Ah, Frank's so twenty. I'm one year before the legal limit. It's okay. kind of confusing too because. In Texas, Frank, Frank's TABC certified. You know, he's got a certification, a license from the government to sell <laughs> alcohol, to sell. and they make you take a test. And it's legal. It's perfectly fine in Texas to have a drink at a bar if you're under 21, if your parent buys you the drink. If in Texas, it's fuzzy. It doesn't have to yeah. be against the law. It, theoretically, his dad could have well, could have been there with him and bought him a well, drink. Well, the ticket he was written was minor in consumption. Frank, talk more about how the cop treated you. I feel like his probable cause, I felt like he was lying to us because he said we parked at the fire lane, but we actually stopped and let our friend out to go to his house and then parked. And on the ticket, it says probable cause is parking violation. And that was There's actually a place on the ticket for the probable cause? Yeah. That's amazing. That just says to me that the cops have it all set up. You know, they're not protecting people. They're setting it up to process bodies through their system to get money out of them. Oh, yeah. They know the ins and outs, and they're, <clears throat> in their mind, they're just being efficient. You know? Yeah. And, and the, the other thing I really hate <laughs> about this, you know, we were talking about perjury and should Frank have said something different to the cops. I don't think he should have said anything, but cops can lie to people all the time. I mean, I know. what about the double standard there? They have whole operations. They have whole TV shows dedicated to these operations where cops do nothing <laughs> but lie. That's a really good point. I mean, to catch a predator, you know, anything where the cop is posing as a drug buyer or even a drug seller, um, the bait car operations. Yeah. Although, of all of those, the bait car ones are the least heinous to me because they're actually going after a real crime that I think should be a real crime. But it's not a real crime that, that people commit. Because it's that, a fake car. It's a fake car. They're not stealing yeah. somebody's it's, actual it's property. It's setting somebody up, which I don't think is right. A crime didn't exist. In that instance, yeah, the crime until the, they made the, it. The, yeah, they, yeah, they it could be argued that it. it's entrapment. I think it's totally entrapment. The basic point that cops are allowed, not only allowed to lie, but it's part of their job. Yet it's illegal for us to do it. There's just a whole double standard of cops have different rights and the government has different rights, and we are cattle and they are our overlords. And a lot of it is like you know it's showing. I mean, Barack Obama's approval rating dropped to an all-time low this week, and it's a week that he's suggesting and trying to enforce something where six people or twelve people, you know, the super Congress is going to be able to to make all the decisions. And whose idea was that? Congress's approval rating is also the lowest it's ever been. It's something like six percent, I think. And Obama's trying to uh, follow his hero, hero of Hugo Chavez to rule by Twitter. But he's really doing it wrong. Um, Obama's Twitter account recently spammed a bunch of people, <laughs> and and he lost like forty thousand users. What was the Obama Twitter spam? I'm dying to know. He spammed all the Republican congressmen and senators' Twitter accounts with "You should vote this way." Ah, uh, wow. But and it was done like one right after the other, like by a bot, like alphabetically. Yeah. By yeah. last name, you know, like literally spamming. Also, with, with it. I really doubt that it was actually Obama's fingers typing it into his cell phone. It was probably his press corps writing whatever. It's probably his it idea, though. Probably his I don't idea, know. but he delegated He's, it to somebody he, else. He probably doesn't micromanage to that level, but he would hire people that would do what he wants. Right. Exactly. Whereas I, I actually picture Chavez sitting in a hospital bed with a cigar in his mouth. With his laptop. Yeah, and probably. You Using government money to give little smartphones to all the soldiers and law enforcers and military so they can 
see the law updates, and they probably love it. They're like, oh, we got free things. We got a little chromed robot turd to follow our <laughs> glorious leader. Exactly. You ever heard that chromed robot turd for any what they call your electronics, anything you can't put up, <laughs> hook up to a printer? Whoa. And we're technology. Oh, it's from Boondocks, remember? And I'm quoting Boondocks. It's not my words. <laughs> it's anything you can't hook up to a printer. It's the Samuel L. Jackson character that explains it. Yeah. Oh, no. I I don't think I've seen that episode. It's a great episode. It's uh, when Ed Wunsler Jr. and Samuel L. Jackson's character, which they're both white dudes voiced by black dudes, <laughs> breaking into people's houses. And the dude, Ed Wunsler Jr., can't get off the cell phone. He's got the Bluetooth in. He's talking about uh, bitches and hoes. And <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson's just ragging on him. He's like, get off of that N-word technology. <laughs> N-word technology. Yeah, I'll uh, make it PC and put that in. So, Frank, tell us more about uh, the man keeping you down. Oh, actually, did you know the city of Kima now has Camaro undercover cop cars? Dude, that is so square. <laughs> when I was a kid, like, the only people that had Camaros were like, when I was 14, there'd be like, there'd always be this like 19 or 20 year old high school dropout who was dealing coke out of a Camaro and had a mullet and his name was always Mike <laughs> right? for some reason you know yeah our white trash stepdads always had Camaros growing up oh yeah that was the thing Camaros. my mom my mom loved a dude with a mullet and a Camaro Camaros, when we were Camaros would stand out anywhere except maybe Texas or Florida yeah well they're the new Camaros so they they look you know like a bastardized new Dodge Charger it looks like or I'm in the RoboCop movie or something Every time I drive through Kima. Yeah. Not only that, but they've got these uh, these mobile cherry pickers, too, where they, like, lift themselves up and shoot yeah. radar guns at people. At, like, special events, they'll, like, raise up a cherry picker, and it's run by uh, these two big generators. And it's all tinted out, and there's, like, you'll see different uh, things around the side. And you can just see a cop barely just standing there watching people. Yeah, yeah. Watching from the towers yeah. of their status the tower. technology. I have a correction for something Nima said in the last cast. We were talking about cattle shoots, and he said, you mean where the cattle go before the cowboys ride them? Now, what's wrong with that sentence, well, Nima? see, I think, I, I see where you're going with that, but I was thinking of rodeos, and I guess I was thinking of bulls, because in rodeos, uh, they have the shoots that they put the bull in, and then the, the cowboy gets on the bull. And I thought you thought that cowboys back in the day rode cows no, around I, all the time. No, I, I know that cowboys don't ride cows, but I've covered you're, a lot of rodeos in <laughs> Wyoming and, and shot a lot of video of rodeos, and so I was thinking... That was kind of, that was kind of a cowpoke comment. Do you know what a cowpoke is? you know where that word comes from? No. Mm, uh, is that one of the, the bums, the, the, the lower bottom barrel It was cow usually like young teenage boys... It was a job that existed when cowboys existed, but it was much less skilled and much lower paid and not glamorous at Did all. Did they literally poke was, the cows? They poked the cows <laughs> with sticks to get them to go on the train at the end of the cattle ride. Nice, nice. Cowpoke. Cowpoke. Well, we got a little cowpoke here if we want to let my other little brother, Knight, get on and just... I absolutely want to hear from all him. All right. How old say is he? Say hi. He's 10 years old. Uh, you have anything else to say, Frank, before we, we uh, let you go? No, I'd just like to say thank you all for letting me be on the podcast, and uh, shout out to all the Freedom Fiends. Shout out to the Freedom Excellent. Fiends. Excellent. Thanks, Frank. Uh -huh. It's been good having you on. All right, we'll bring... Now uh, get the next generation up here on we, your lap. We got, we got three generations here. Here we go, Knight. Go ahead and put the headphones on. Knight, can you hear? Michael Dean, say hi to Knight, see if he can hear you. Hello, Knight. How you doing? I'm doing good. All right, speak up a little bit, Knight. Knight wanted to tell us how his school feels. He actually did homeschool for a year, did great, was testing like, he's, he's only 10. He was testing like eighth grade in math. He was almost finished with school in January, but my mom had to, to do a lot more work, so she had to put him back in the tyrannical public schools. How does it feel to be back in, in the public school grind night? And get a little closer to the mic. It feels a bit like prison to me. It feels like prison to you. And it looks like prison too, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. They built this new school, looks just like a prison. Why does it feel like prison to you, Knight? Well, it's just the way they run things there. They're too strict and they have us in lines with our hands behind our back. With your hands behind Ugh. your back? Like we have it's handcuffs horrible. on. Really? You have mental handcuffs on. They're training you for the, the real world. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. And um, what about the, the curriculum? How are you taught? It's different than when you were on your own, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't really like the curriculum. They're making us do writing and math, and they're making us do math in writing. Okay, okay. So basically, uh, from what my mom was telling me, you have to write stories about math instead of doing math problems nowadays? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So instead of teaching you something that's actually useful in the real world, they're, they're doing a weird way to do it that doesn't help you. Yeah, but I was in a K-12 for 
only in third grade, but I tested real well. Right. K-12 is uh, a homeschooling program they have here in Texas. It's basically free online schooling. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's very nice. And I think they actually started it in Wyoming, too. And I think it's important when we talk about education. You know, people are still trying to build schools, get bonds. And back in Washington State, there was like 28 school bonds. All these schools needed new – all these districts needed new schools. They all failed. Nobody wanted to build the new schools. So all the schools are scrambling to find other ways to tax the people. In this day and age, do you really need a brick-and-mortar school anymore? I mean, you have things like Knight was saying, the K-12 program where it's all done through the internet. He was doing so much better. He was testing eighth grade in math. You have Khan Academy, which you should Google Khan, K-A-H-N, Khan Academy, if you're interested. It's got a whole, not only a high school curriculum, but even well into college curriculum. That's all YouTubes of this very fun-to-watch guy teaching lessons. And the lessons are YouTube videos. You can pause it. You can go backwards. You can go at your own pace. You don't have to wait for the rest of the class. You don't have to. And there's no bullies. There's no bullies. You can do it all or in there, comfort or of your own home. Or you can block them. Yeah. <laughs> if they're on, on YouTube. I don't think they comment on. Yeah, they don't comment on your, your quiz scores. The other thing about <laughs> it is they don't let you move on to the next chapter until you get a perfect score on their quiz. In Khan Academy? In, in Khan Academy, online. So they've discovered that it's much better for kids to have complete proficiency in it, not just a basic understanding of whatever the concept is. But, but also to work it. at their own rate. They work at their own rate. They don't go until they've mastered something, and then it makes it easier for the next lesson. Now, see, I would actually consider that a downside because the way I learn is kind of scattered, but I end up learning a lot, but I'd want to jump around chapters. Well, it is a tree. It's, it's not linear. So uh, yeah. it's a tree. So if, if you're having trouble and you hit a wall, you can actually go on to uh, any other different chapter, just not in that specific line. But you can go around to, you know, you have – dozens of options you can jump around to. So you don't have to stay focused. It's not, oh, I have to do this one math quiz and, and I don't get to do any other lessons until I do that. You do get to jump around. So has Knight seen your movie? Knight, you've seen Guns and Weed, right? Uh, yeah, I have. What did you think? I think that everything in there that any of the people in there that they said w was right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You're young and impressionable. <laughs> Knight, do you think that movie should be shown in public school? Yes. <laughs> Do you think it ever will be shown in public school? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? They don't want kids to learn about that stuff, I guess. They don't want kids to learn the truth about the world? No, they don't. <laughs> How else do you see that in public school as opposed to learning on your own? What else do you see of hidden agendas or ways that they try to push things that have nothing to do with what you're learning? What do they do that is not connected with the school that you don't like, that's not connected with the education that you don't like? Just the way they teach things, that's just annoying to me. <laughs> do they say the Pledge of Allegiance? Every day. Every day, Did no matter what. They may if you wear a hat, you just have to put it up to your heart and stuff. You put your hands up to your heart, one hand behind your back. And you just look at the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance. One hand behind your back now. That's new. They didn't do that when I was yeah. in school. Practicing for being handcuffed by the state that you're yeah. pledging. They, they let one you know, hand free so you can salute them. <laughs> I learned something today about the Pledge of Allegiance that I didn't know. I mean, I knew that it was written by a socialist who got it into schools to help sell American flags. But I didn't know that the under God part wasn't added until the Cold War in the 50s. And it was added in there to try to make patriotism inexorably linked with people's religion. So people would think, I'm not a good religious person if I don't worship everything this country does right. unquestioningly. Which is very sinister. And they sold it to the public as a response to the Soviets, to the communists who were inherently in their philosophy are supposed to be atheists. I'm sure that there are people who, if they listen to this cast, would think that the government should get involved because we're telling a 10-year-old that uh, maybe he should question things. <laughs> maybe. But he's my family, so I have more of a claim on him than any bureaucrat. You own him. You own I him. don't own him, but I... <laughs> I'm kidding. I own him more than somebody from CPS does. Yeah. That's for damn sure. And it's voluntary. You're not being coerced, are you, Knight? No. He wanted to do this. He's been waiting here patiently listening to me talk to a computer for an hour yeah. until he could get on. What else do you want to say, Knight? I wanted to ask you if you knew that they don't really provide that much textbooks in my school, nor do they provide bus service to my neighborhood. The rich Actually, neighborhood gets I, bus service, but this uh, neighborhood doesn't. I only learned that, like, yesterday, because, you know, my wife has two kids from a previous marriage, and she told me that 
you know, when I was a kid, you didn't have to bring money to school except for your school lunch. And now she says that you have to pay for everything. You know, you have to pay for your books. You have to pay for $50 when you go on a trip. You have to bring scissors and paste and art supplies. And I didn't know that until yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's ha- how they've been right. Happening more and more. It's like not only do they tax you and make you pay for something that you don't agree with or necessarily agree with, but then they charge you more to do it. Yeah, yeah. Knight, what do they do with kids that are from really poor families that can't afford those things? They don't really do anything. They're just like, okay, cool, go to class. That's So those kids don't have the supplies? No, not really. Wow. Do private organizations like churches or anything or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts donate things for those kids? Not that much, but every once in a while. But I actually went to a Boy Scouts meeting. I'm not part of Boy Scouts, but I went to like a meeting with my friend because he had to get one of those badges. But they had one of those plastic party tables, one of those really long party tables, and they were all stacked with like pamphlets of um, things that say things against weed, like saying, don't do it, it'll kill you, just stuff like that whole table full Mm. another set of brainwashing going on there well in not too long you'll be 18 and you could make up your own mind about those things (laughs) by the way we just as a disclaimer no children were harmed in the making of this podcast but some cats were mildly annoyed (laughs) well we gotta wrap it up here b wrap it up b all right you have any final thoughts how about night you have any final thoughts night they should um Provide poor families with the supplies that they don't who should have. Who should supply them? Who should pay for them? Um, I think the school should at least donate to the poor families for school supplies, like pencils, textbooks, notebooks. But they should also add textbooks into the school. What do you think about the idea of private organizations like Boy Scouts and churches doing that instead? I think anyone who donates stuff to the poor families that they don't have, it's. I think they're good people. Okay. Good. Cool. All right. That's it from down here in coastal Texas. We got to say peace. You guys going to go uh, do some paintballing today? Uh, all the places are closed today unless you can get a group of 10 or more to go and, and schedule it. So, All right, Freedom Fiends. If you email Nima in the next five minutes. <laughs> We're going to well, go on Friday. We'll go, we'll go shoot each other on Friday. Should be good fun. Okay. Cool, man. It was really fun having your family on here, and I like this podcast, and I like this episode, and it's good talking to you, and have fun in Texas, y'all. All right, man. Peace. 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 Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, Dean, from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I owe me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission, and I won't say please. Freedom fans, for fact that I gotta make clear it. The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every Friday night, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadati weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them.